Student Advisory Board, and I am here today to introduce Sarah Kemp, who will be discussing her thesis, Concussions in Female Collegiate Diving, an Exploratory Study. A concussion is one of the most complicated sports-related injuries that an athlete can sustain. It's a traumatic brain injury caused by a direct flow to the head, neck, face, or anywhere on the body that transmits an impulse to the brain. It results in pathophysiological disturbances in the brain that are functional rather than structural damage. A concussion usually results in symptoms of neurological impairment that quickly appear after the impact. Research has found that headache, dizziness, and difficulty concentrating are the three most common symptoms of a concussion. No two concussions are the same, which makes it challenging to recognize and diagnose them. It's estimated that 1.6 to 3.8 million sports-related concussions occur each year. And the variance in this number is due to the suspected number of undiagnosed concussions. American football is consistently found to have the highest prevalence rate of concussions. And for women's sports only, that sport, the most concussions occur in soccer, according to previous literature. There's no gold standard method of concussion management. Every concussion is unique, so the return to play decision must be individualized to the person, taking into consideration a variety of physiological and psychological factors. Due to the brain's vital role in preserving a good quality of life, a more conservative approach to management is recommended. Although the management of concussions is, um, varies, the, it is agreed worldwide that no athlete with a suspected concussion should return to play on the same day of the impact. The typical treatment for a concussion includes uh, physical and cognitive rest um, until the symptoms have resolved. And then the athlete should follow a six-day protocol that most NCAA universities use, and it involves a gradual return to practice. Approximately 70% of athletes will recover in less than 10 days, according to previous research. The NCAA, or returning to play before the brain is fully healed, um, is very dangerous, and it can result in second impact syndrome. This occurs when an athlete sustains a second impact shortly after the initial impact, when the brain is still vulnerable. Second impact syndrome has an alarming rate of 50% mortality, which is why not returning on the same day is so important. Psychological recovery is just as important as physical recovery when it comes to concussions. Premature return to play can lead to increased fear, anxiety, depression, and the chances of re-injury also increase. It's important to make sure the athlete is confident while keeping realistic expectations of their abilities post-concussion. When most people think of a diving-related concussion, they probably imagine this first picture, where a diver hits their head on the board. However, as I will talk about later, it is more common for a concussion to result from hitting the head on the water when they land wrong in the water, like the second picture. Divers, on average, sustain 50 to 60 head-first impacts per practice, and a free-falling diver can reach speeds of up to 30 miles an hour when performing a dive. So if something goes wrong in these dives, a concussion can easily result. Despite the abundant amount of research being done on concussions right now, there is a gap in the research on sports that are not traditionally thought of as contact sports. The purpose of my study was to begin filling that gap by researching, by researching women's collegiate springboard and platform diving. The research questions I examined are what are the what is the prevalence of diving-related concussions, diagnosed and undiagnosed, in collegiate women's diving? What is the length of time from most recent concussion to returning to play for the divers? And lastly, in regards to readiness to return to the sport, how confident are divers to participate in diving following a concussion? So I created a survey that included three different types of questions. First, there is prevalence questions. Some examples of these are, have you ever had a concussion, diagnosed or undiagnosed, while participating in the sport of diving? And also, did the concussion result from hitting the board, the platform, the water, or other? And the purpose of these questions were to get, first of all, an idea of how many diving-related concussions have occurred, and also to get an idea of some of the characteristics of those concussions. 
sessions. The second aspect of the survey was a symptom checklist that was taken from the Sports Concussion Assessment Tool 3, and it included 21 different symptoms for the athletes to choose from. The, this assessment tool is commonly used by athletic trainers when diagnosing concussions. The last part of the survey was questions regarding readiness to return to the sport, and these were measured by a Likert scale ranging from 1, which was very unconfident, the five, which is very confident. An example of this type of question is how confident were you to complete the dive that resulted in the concussion again? So the study received, uh, re received approval from the Institutional Review Board, and I then emailed 20 different coaches from Midwestern universities asking permission to use their divers in this study. Those who agreed were sent the survey to forward on to their athletes. And in all 24, Female collegiate divers uh, filled out the survey, and the average age of the participants were 20 years old, and they're participating in diving for an average of 7.94 years. Statistical analyses and techniques using the statistical package for social sciences were used to answer the research questions. And I'm going to talk about the most significant results of my research. 54.2% of the participants reported sustaining at least one diving-related concussion in their career. Of those concussions, 84.6 of them were diagnosed, and 15.4 of them were undiagnosed. The divers also reported waiting an average of 12.15 hours to seek medical help after their concussion. 75% of the concussions occurred while diving off of the 3-meter springboard. 16.7 occurred while diving off of the one meter springboard, and 8.3 of them occurred off of the 10 meter platform. The concussion was caused by hitting the head against the water in 83.3% of the concussions, and the border platform accounted for only 8.3. The front category of dives was by far the most common type of dive being performed when the concussion occurred, and specifically front three and a half somersaults in the tuck position accounted for 25% of the concussions. Headache, dizziness, and difficulty concentrating were the three most common symptoms that I found, and they occurred in 91.7% of the concussions. The divers reported being asymptomatic in an average of 15 days post-concussion, and they reported returning to practice in an average of 23 days. As for readiness to return, on average, the responses based on the Likert scale were fairly neutral. So these numbers exceeded even my expectations going into this study. The sport with the highest number of reported concussions is consistently found to be football. The prevalence of a football player sustaining at least one concussion in their career is likely around 15%, according to several sources, and this number is growing due to the increase in diagnosis of concussions. This number is still much lower than the number of divers who reported being sustaining a concussion in this study, which was 54.2%. It is possible that if a diver has sustained a concussion in the past, they are more likely to fill out the survey than a diver who has never sustained a concussion, and that could skew the data slightly. However, that difference between those two numbers is still very large. Another statistic was that the divers waited 12.15 hours to seek medical help after a concussion, and this suggests that concussions are not being recognized right away by coaches or athletes. It's important for all coaches and athletes, despite the risk, despite the sport, to understand the signs and symptoms of a concussion in order to prevent further complications. 75% of, of the concussions occurred while diving off of the three meter plot springboard. However, only one participating school had the full 10 meter platform setup that is shown in this picture. If the study was limited to schools that had this full 10 meter platform, I would guess that more concussions would occur from the higher levels than the lower levels. The higher up someone falls from, the greater speeds they will reach in the air. Speeds reached when diving off of the one meter and three meter springboards are not as high as than diving off of the 10 meter platform. Therefore, if concussions do occur on these lower levels, they will likely occur more often on the higher levels where greater speeds are reached. Hitting the 
bored with your head is very rare in diving. However, it can be very tragic when it does happen. More likely, a concussion will result from hitting your head on the water while being at high speeds while being unprepared for the impact. And this was the case in 83% of the concussions. As I said before, the front category of dives accounted for most of the concussions in this study. And one hypothesis for this may be that the front, the front category typically has the quickest rotation that a diver performs in their list of dives. So when learning these dives, if something goes wrong, the rotation is a lot quicker than other dives that they perform. And that rotation, along with hitting the water, will create even higher forces on their head, and that could cause a concussion. Headache, dizziness, and difficulty concentrating were found as the three most common symptoms, and that supports the literature, with the literature says that those three are the most common. However, as you can see, headache was found at about 92%, which follows the established value from the literature. However, dizziness and difficulty concentrating were found at much larger um, rates in this study compared to previous studies. One reason for dizziness being higher may be that diving requires a significant amount of flipping and twisting. Because of this, an athlete might notice the dizziness more than if they were participating in a sport that involved running and jumping. The literature I explored, the literature I read explored the number of concussions that healed in less than 10 days, and also the number of concussions that took longer than four weeks to recover. I decided to analyze the same time frame so that I could compare the results. I found that 64% of the concussions um, were asymptomatic in less than 10 days post-impact. And the established value for that number is about 70%, which is just slightly higher. The percent of athletes who took longer than four weeks to recover, however, was almost triple as high as the established value. This suggests that divers may experience symptoms longer after a concussion compared with athletes of other sports. More evidence for this theory comes from the mean number of days it took for an athlete to be asymptomatic, which was 15 days, as I said before. Previous studies have established this value to be between seven and 10 days. More research is needed, however, to determine the cause of this discrepancy. 17% of athletes reported returning to play on the same day of their impact before getting diagnosed with a concussion. According to the literature, that number was found to be 5.5%. More research is needed to determine if the cause of this high number in diving is due to a lack of knowledge about the signs and symptoms of a concussion, or if it is due to athletes lying about symptoms so that they don't have to sit out, or also if it is about the if it is caused by a delayed onset of those symptoms. The participants of this study experienced a variety of results, or had a variety of experiences with psychological readiness to return. And although there was no trend found, the variety can be attributed to several different factors. People handle the stress of being injured and the process of returning differently due to differing personalities. So one person might handle the adversity like a challenge and come back even stronger than they were before, where another person with a more anxious personality might come back and be more cautious and timid as they return. Positive encouragement is another factor that might influence psychological readiness to return. Specifically, interactions with the coach may influence an athlete's confidence. Negative exchanges regarding the concussion, the recovery process, or return to play may make an athlete uh, increasingly apprehensive as they return. Previous experience with concussions or injuries in general could influence their psychological readiness to return as well. Having been through the process before with the previous concussion may make them more ready to come back because they've experienced it before. The most unconfident response in the survey came from the question about completing the dive that resulted in the concussion again. Coaches should be aware of this hesitancy as the diver is beginning to practice, and they can have the diver perform lots of lead-up drills or mentally visualize the dive over and over again to help them be even more prepared and feel more confident about the dive. This study showed that collegiate female springboard and platform divers are in danger of sustaining concussions. 
A large amount of resor resources are being poured into research right now on sports-related concussions. It's concerning when reading the current literature that a gap exists with sports that are not as popular. As, although it is not, consi not traditionally considered a contact sport, divers regularly sustain intense impacts of the water at up to 30 miles an hour. As the results of this study revealed, the risk of concussions in diving is serious. Future research should be done to look at how the height, the type of dive, and the mechanism of impact affects the risk of concussion. Also, more focus should be placed on examining the factors that influence an athlete's confidence when returning from a concussion. Divers deserve the most accurate diagnoses and treatments available, so it is critical that athletes, coaches, and athletic trainers understand the risk of concussions in diving. baseline testing when you first come into college so that if you do sustain a concussion you can take that test again and kind of compare to that baseline. So I think that is helpful and I personally think any athlete regardless of the sport should have to take that test and get a baseline because concussions can happen in any sport and if you are going to be a collegiate athlete there is that risk and so I think maybe requiring all sports to do that would be good but specifically with diving I think they do a good job of that. So do athletes report concussions or do coaches recognize them? Like is there an athlete's responsibility or are coaches able to? Yeah, I think it's a mix. Um, with, I think, historically, like football players generally don't report their own concussions, so I think it might be more of a coach's job to do it in those sports. Um, and men in general report concussions less than females. I have some statistics on that that I found. Um, so female athletes may be more inclined, <laughs> may be more inclined to um, report their concussion, and they won't need the coach to. But it is a coach's responsibility ultimately if they think the athlete has sustained a concussion to pull them from practice or competition so that more um, further complications don't happen. Can you talk to us a little bit about? How many coaches responded to you? And you had 24 yep. people. Open yes. To this. I, I just like to know about their reaction to this. Yeah, test. I had 10 coaches respond, oh, giving yeah. me permission out of 20, and the other 10 just didn't respond. I didn't get any no's. Um, so, coaches of athletic teams get a lot of um, requests to have their athletes participate in research. So I'm assuming those coaches just kind of brushed it off as another research study. So. I was hoping that if they recognized my name, that would make them more inclined to actually uh, fill the survey out. That's why I sent it to Midwestern universities and limited my study to that. I thought I'd get a better response rate. And so 10 coaches responded yes, and so I sent it out to them. I have no idea which athletes um, filled out the survey, but I got 24 response, responses from that. And generally, schools have about five, on average, five divers at their school, so 10 times 5 is about 50, so it's about a 50% response rate, which I'm really happy with. But overall, a couple of coaches asked me like, what the purpose of the study, what my anticipated results were. They seemed very interested in it, but they were all very willing to have um, to help out in the study. That was cool. So I have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans for sharing your findings with those coaches? <laughs> I need to talk to her about that. <laughs> that in <your laughs> or publish I think that this is uh, amazing. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about this in terms of the literature and filling a gap in the literature. Yeah, I think, I think since but. there's no previous studies that have done anything on this, I think it would be really cool to at least get the NCAA's attention so that they start looking at it and start paying attention to the risk. Because one thing I did um, think about during this whole process is that 
The concussion rate for diving is usually mixed in with swimming, so it's reported as a swimming and diving concussion rate. It's pretty rare for a swimmer to get a concussion, unless you rail your head against the side of the pool, like one of our teammates. Like <laughs> 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 uh, but <No. laughs> that's that a little more rare, so you're making 80 to 85 percent of the team doesn't have very many concussions, but that 10 to 15 percent, or 15 to 20 percent, has them all. So I think if studies have looked at would look at those that small percentage of the population, I think more, I think they would have gotten more attention about it. I'm doing a little quick math on that. If every diver who didn't respond didn't have, mm -hmm. if they had responded and didn't have a concussion, you'd still be at like 20 to 25 percent, yeah. which is better. I did that math too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which is a Significant findings. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. But, but all these findings are all self-report. A lot of them are self-reported. Yes. So it's not. There could be. It could be a lot higher just because people yeah. don't self-report. It could be. Yeah. Okay. And I think that your study could shed light on this, and then um, because most of the studies, most of the prevalent studies, use athletic training trainers and medical staff, mm -hmm. and they're the ones yes, who then exactly. report how many concussions the team got, for, yeah, which is then that self-report and we don't have that bias, and so... If the NCAA were to do a study, they would be much more accurate, and they would be yeah. able to get those medical documents. Ex right. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, then it wouldn't even be up to the athlete to choose to participate in the study. They would get permission from the university and get those medical documents, which mm -hmm. would provide much better results, but... Do you think there's resistance? on the part of coaches to report stuff? Overall, yes. But I think that is changing with the amount of research that is being poured into concussions. Um, I think people are realizing the dangers associated with it, that that does outweigh the glory of winning that one game if you put the athlete back in. Um, so I think they want to as long as they understand those risks, I think they would choose protecting the athlete over winning the game or, yeah. So yes, you I think, think there that, is huh? resistance. I, I hope she's so. much more optimistic. <laughs> she's much more optimistic than I am, too. I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I know so much about the risks. Because they want. I know so much about the risks that obviously <laughs> I'm going to think that. I'm a little bit cynical, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm an optimist. <laughs> you really are an optimist. <laughs> I think with sports like diving and stuff like that, it might be more common, to, or that might be more the case with the optimism. Maybe in football, they would be more, they'd be more inclined to put the athlete back in. The high stakes. Yeah. Or, yeah. The high stakes and the, in the public, yeah. Have I know that. Attention. Like professional sports versus mm -hmm. Yep, I didn't include sports. any professional sports in this study. I decided to limit it to okay. college sports, and I didn't include any high school either. But there's lots of research done on both of those age groups too, and a lot of a lot of research is being done on younger athletes too, and their risks and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like so. a rec ball. Yep. Any other questions? But I think even still, the attention there still gets mostly with football and soccer, yes, with concussions, absolutely. and so and when we're looking hockey. at and ice hockey, and so when we're looking at even younger athletes, those who are gymnasts and even divers. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be sustaining them, but no one is aware yeah. that that, you know, that there may be a high prevalence. That's very true. So do you think gymnastics should be sort of like this? You were a gymnast. Yes. <laughs> I, I did find a couple studies that analyzed gymnastics, and the most interesting thing that I found from that was that the dizziness symptom was the highest in gymnastics. And I think that's very similar to diving, is that it involves a lot of flipping and twisting. So that's kind of how I came to that hypothesis about um, that. But they are prevalent in gymnastics, but honestly not as much as I was expecting. But there was only one or two um, research studies that I found that analyzed it, so I think more research should be done. And I think about the impact in the water, though, being very yeah, different. The, the and increased speed, speed also. I think, makes the difference. But, yeah. You should do cliff diving. There we go. Fast <laughs> <laughs> really fast. Because this is the highest. Head open. In that picture, I showed the highest level was 10 meters. They'll go from minimum 20 meters. So it increases that even more. 
Yeah. So, so I have a final question yes. to ask. Uh, what have you learned about research during this process, and what has been sort of your biggest challenge with it? I've learned that I actually really enjoyed this whole process, and I didn't expect to at all. But if you take it step by step, it really isn't that big of a deal. This is for you future honors <laughs> thesis writers. Um, it's, I don't know, if you just take it step by step, it's not too overwhelming. And I think my favorite part of it was actually getting my results back and being able to analyze that. It was so cool, because it's what I've been preparing for all last, all the fall, mm -hmm. I finally gave out my research study, got the results back, and could look at the results of all my hard work. So that was definitely the coolest part. The hardest, mm -hmm. the biggest challenge, mm -hmm. um, probably just getting participants, because it is, I mean, it's a very small number of participants, but I am happy with the mm -hmm. number I got, but. I've, I've learned that not everybody wants to participate in research studies, so <laughs> it's sometimes pulling the hands to get them to actually do it. So I think that's for the rest of your life, you will be more apt to complete a research study. <laughs> yes. I've, I've already done like four or five of the ones I've gotten in here this semester okay. because I know. And let me, can I, I'm just going to add on to that, Sarah, because I've worked with you. One, you were also very passionate about this topic, yeah. and that helped the process immensely, yeah. um, because it's something you were really interested in. Um, and you also really enjoyed the discussion. You liked making meaning about your results. I did. Yes. Which, All the hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had fun. Good job.